So I'm just shaking your head. That means we are L-I-V-E with Fred Rooney. We are on air. Fred, welcome to New York. Always great to see you. Fred is a Fulbright Fellow, attorney at law, and overall just one handsome and great human. Fred, thanks for coming. It's great to be here, Brian. So Fred, tell us a little bit about, we're going to jump into, we have some questions, and we have, for those of you that are wondering what these flags are, these are the places that Fred does a lot of legal work, social access to justice work. Fred has been named as the godfather and, and of the uh, legal incubator. We're going to get into all that. We have some questions that came in from Pakistan. Without further ado, Fred, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you're here today. Well, I'm here because you generously invited me to come and speak, and I've been a big follower of yours. I mean, we, you know, we, we probably have a mutual admiration society because I feel very committed to what you're doing. I've watched you grow. I met Brian when he started law school at City University of New York Law School. In Twelve years ago. 12 years ago, and I was working there, and uh, we sort of clicked immediately because we had a common connection to my hometown, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and and I knew that uh, we also we had some friends in common, and we had a lot of things in common. So, you know, he's watched my career develop, and I've also watched his career develop. You know, his friends speaking, a little older than me, just put that just up a there. little bit, right? But uh, you know, seeing him go to the Dominican Republic, working in an orphanage, and and then. Once he got out of law school, just you know, his career took off in ways that were uh, astounding. And now, you know, watching him go all over the world, doing great things, using his skills and his education and his privilege to help other people is really inspiring. And so uh, I think we both have tried to come full circle. And just being here this morning, Brian, is, is exciting for me because I've been watching you on YouTube. I've been watching the proliferation of all of your, your work um, in social media. And you got a great team. You can't. Nobody who is watching this can see the the young people behind us who are um, broadcasting this. But uh, it's great again to be here. So we're looking at uh, Pakistan, Spain, Dominican Republic, and India. And so to my friends who are watching from there, uh, it's great to have you uh, listening. And hopefully you can, if you have questions or you want to make any comments, that's what we're here for. So Fred. Just take us back a little bit in terms of where did you get started? You were born and raised in New York. Tell us a little bit about why you do the work that you do and just give us like a two to three minute thing overview about you as an attorney, as an advocate, as a fellow. What, what else do we need to know about you? The journey itself. Take us back to the yeah. origin story. I was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and when uh, I was a year and a half, my family moved to Long Island. Um, back in those days, most of Long Island were, were potato fields, and so my dad, you know, was in the military, and through the GI Bill was educated. And then, uh, shortly after he graduated from Lehigh University, my sisters, my mom and dad, and I moved to Long Island. And so I was raised uh, first in Plainview, Long Island, and then later in, uh, in Garden City. And you know, I, I had a, a, an amazing childhood. Um, we never wanted for anything. And Garden City was a really beautiful town, uh, and so I grew up in, but in a very sheltered environment. And so it was only when I went to college. I went to Moravian College. In my third year, I had an opportunity to to study in Colombia, South America, and for the first time in my life, I was faced with seeing on a day to day basis issues of poverty, mm -hmm. um, you know, homelessness, the kinds of things I didn't see in Plainview or Garden City or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And my whole world sort of turned upside down because it was for the first time in my life that I was faced with seeing the realities of what most of the people throughout the world um, experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, you know, it was very exciting to be away. And being in South America through Moravian College was really the beginning of, then I would say, the internationalization of my horizon and, and my, my view of the world. And at this point, did you speak Spanish? No, I had always enjoyed Spanish. I remember my fourth grade teacher taught us to count from one to ten. This was in Plainview. And from that moment on, I was intrigued by the language and then always you know, tried to learn it as much as I could. But you know, in junior high and high school and then even in college, 
you take classes, but you get out of the classes and you really don't know how to speak yep. Spanish. I got to, to South America and I was forced to speak Spanish for the first time in my life and that's when I started developing the language skills that then eventually would go on to be really the source of my livelihood for the rest of my life, speaking Spanish. And so that, so then the, you utilize the Spanish for, for, for the first time professionally as a social worker or a professor of English as a second language, right? What, what, what was the next thing after college? Yeah, you're right. I got out of Moravian College, and um, I do have to say that there was one person in my academic years and my academic background who had more impact on me than anybody else in the world. His name is Gary Olson, Professor Gary Olson, <coughs> and he just uh, retired from Moravian College last year. When I came back from South America, I was really conflicted because I couldn't quite understand why we lived the way we did and so much of the rest of the world lived the way they did. And it was fortunately in my last year at Moravian that I, Gary kind of put things in, the, in perspective from an economic standpoint and, and broke down what were the kinds of reasons why you know, we were able to live as, as well as we do and why others don't. And he really did change my life. And it was once I, I met Gary, everything came into, 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 you know, into play. And from that point on, I started really focusing my life on, on trying to serve people, especially those in need. Uh, I got out of Moravian and I started working. In, I was a ESL teacher slash social worker in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I continued to work in that capacity until until I was about 26, and then I, I left my employment, moved to, to Puerto Rico, and started to, to work there. And then, you know, I had an opportunity to travel. I, I moved to Israel and worked on the West Bank, um, and so I spent time in Israel and the Palestinian territories at the time. And that gave me some insight into the issues going on in the Middle East. And, you know, I got a master's degree in, in bicultural, bilingual, studies, which was really linguistics and teaching English as a second language. And I did that until uh, I went to law school, the City University of New York, to CUNY Law School in, in 1983. Yeah. That was the first, CUNY's first class, right? You were part of CUNY's I first was. graduating class? Yeah. I went to CUNY Law School because, as you said, it was a brand new law school. The City of New York had plenty of law schools that were helping people to develop their skills that would eventually be used to serve corporations. and. What the city understood is that there was a tremendous need to train lawyers to do something other than simply get out of law school and work in, in corporations. And so CUNY was established, it's, it opened up its doors for the first time in 1983. And the mission of CUNY Law from the beginning has always been law in the service of human needs. Yeah. Now, when I decided to go to law school, uh, it was really my first choice because the mission of the law school was in, in, in really in keeping with my own values of, of using law to help people, um, people who were in need of access to lawyers and couldn't afford it, you know, people who basically were shut out of the system because they just couldn't afford, afford the cost of, of legal services or they didn't qualify for legal aid. Mm -hmm. So CUNY was the absolute best place in the world to learn how to develop your skills as a lawyer um, and a lawyer who is committed to serving people in need. It was back in 1983 and it still is today. City University of New York Law School, located in Long Island City, New York. Yeah. At the time it was in Queens, right? In, in Flushing, Queens. It was in Flushing. Well, you're right. I got out of CUNY and I was really excited because by the time I had graduated, I had a job. Yep. Uh, my son was born in my last uh, semester of law school. And when I, before I even graduated from CUNY, I had a job working for the Legal Services Program in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I was very excited. Uh, everybody was excited, my family, my parents, because, you know, their son's a lawyer, he has a job. What I didn't really know immediately, and they didn't know, is that my income working as a legal services attorney, and legal services, for people who don't know, is, is a program that's set up to help economically disadvantaged individuals who couldn't afford, who can't afford legal services, um, and so they can get, in certain instances, they can get services for free. What, what I didn't understand when I took the job is that my income was so low as a lawyer, that under the federal poverty guidelines, had I gone in to apply as a client, I would have qualified. That's how low my, my for public assistance, right? And so, even though people were trying to, you know, kind of connect me with 
corporations and, and large law firms in the Lehigh Valley. And I told my dad, I told my uncle, I went to law school because I really wanted to help people as opposed to working in a, in a, in a corporate setting. And I say that with no, no disrespect to people working right. in corporate settings. Corporations need lawyers, but so do people. So do you know, our everyday people who are struggling to be able to make ends meet. And so in order to be able to stay at legal services for that first year, uh, my family had to depend on social benefits like the WIC program to feed the kids, fuel assistance to heat the house, subsidized daycare. Nobody could believe that a lawyer, first of all, would need that kind of support, or no, number two, had the nerve to apply. But I figured, I'm not going to get this weight from giving up my dream of helping people uh, on a you know, kind of a very grassroots level. By the time I left, I, my daughter had, was born, and so I, we were a family of four, and I, I really needed to start making some money. So I went out into the private practice with uh, my, my partner, my law partner at the time, Michelle Baricchio, who's now a judge in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we opened, opened up a practice in Allentown. And how long did you stay with the practice? Uh, Michelle and I were together for about five years, I think, and then I went out on my own and she went out on her own and I, I started practicing in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah. But, you know, whether it was with Michelle or then on my own, the practice was always designed to support people who really needed a helping hand and couldn't really afford what other lawyers were charging. So, you know what, with a very small firm, we were able to do a lot to meet the unmet legal needs of people in the Lehigh Valley by providing what I would say is very competent but affordable legal fees. So there's a couple things that I think are really, that are really important. Number one, friend learned Spanish as an adult. I also learned Spanish as an adult. So for all the, because so many people write to me and say like, I wish I could speak Spanish, but I'm now I'm 25, now I'm 30, now I'm 40, now I'm 50, and it's just too late for me. I just think that it's just, this is a great example of a man who literally has made an entire career out of something that he learned in his mid-twenties. So if you guys are watching and you think that you're too late into the game at mid-twenties just to learn a language, and I'm actually speaking kind of abstractly about what a language means, it's like anything can be learned at any age. So if you really are passionate about something, he and I are very passionate about Spanish as a language and what that, in terms of what that can fuel in terms of service, just do it. The second thing that I, that I think is really interesting about your story right now, Fred, is that you were willing to basically eat shit for a year, two, three, four, five years to stay true to what was important to you. So many people, and we, we see this all the time, so like so many people write us and say that they're frustrated, they haven't made it yet, and you guys define what made it yet means by 30, by 35, and they're, they say, but the, the, the bottom line is this, people want things too fast, and they don't wanna make any sacrifices if you really want to do the things that you love, in this case, serving people that otherwise maybe wouldn't have access to that service, then you have to be willing to sacrifice things on your side, on your behalf. You've heard my story a million times about sleeping on friends' couches in Airbnb, budgeting every single dime for the first 18 months, putting myself on very limited inter lifestyle enjoyment and stuff. You have to make sacrifices. You have to really check in with yourself about what's important. And the third thing that I think is really fascinating about what Fred is saying right now is there are so many skills that are transferable. Right, so this Spanish and the the commitment to social justice that was Fred's bedrock. That was his that was his foundation. You know, so many people are afraid of, of, of the career shifts. Of they want to they want to stay stable in something for their whole lives, and then when things start to adjust and adapt, they get nervous. Fred is a perfect example of someone who who has consistently kind of swiveled and, and, and turned and pivoted and adjusted and adjusted and adjusted. I mean, he's, you're like at this point, you're what, 30? And you've already had like basically three major careers and you have a family and you have law school. And then what, ha so don't be scared that there's gonna constantly be change, but the transferable skills are what you take with you. Let that be your bedrock. And then it becomes easier to adjust as long as you're staying true to what that thing is. I, I deal with a lot of young people and and I think that they oftentimes, first, they get concerned because they're in their late 20s, early 30s, and, and they still haven't figured out what it is that they want to do. You know, I, I went, I worked after, law, after uh, college, and then, again, I, tra I did some traveling, and then I worked uh, to get a master's degree. But I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so it was only by the time I was almost 30 
that I decided to go to law school. I realized I, I, had, to, I had to do something. I needed to make the commitment to doing something like studying law because I, it was really in my heart to do it, yeah. but I didn't have the guts to, to apply for law school. I didn't think I'd get in. I didn't think I'd get out. I never thought I'd pass the bar. So finally, I just kind of bit the bullet and said, I'm going to apply, and I did. I didn't get out of law school until I was 33. And so, you know, if you're 28 or 29 or 30 or 31, you know, life doesn't necessarily start the day you get out of college. And the, through travel, through, you know, different kinds of experiences, life experiences, when you finally decide to, to do something, whether it's to study or to take a job or to make a, a, a change in career, um, and you have all that to bring with you, I think it makes you a much more mature individual with a, a, a much greater global outlook. That's number one. So, you know, Love that. don't, don't, you know, don't stress, don't stress if you're, you know, in your early 30s. It doesn't matter. You, at some point, may very well come to the realization that this is what I want to do and my time has come. And that may not be when you're 22. It may not be when you're 33. But if you're really sincere and you're really searching, you will find it, what it is that you want to do. The other thing is, I, you know, the sacrifice was not only mine. My family also sacrificed. Yeah. My, my wife, Pam, at the time, and my kids you know, were sacrificing because of my commitment. And so it got to the point where I had to really look very deeply at is how, how my, my decision was impacting on the people I loved. And when I did and I analyzed everything and put everything you know, to, to weigh it all, I realized that I, I had to, to do something other than continue to work for legal services and then be relegated to living in, in be, you know, be below the, the poverty guideline. And what I did learn really quickly is that in order to do good, you have to do well. You cannot expect to be able to help people in your communities. You can't expect to help your family. You can't expect to do anything in society that really can create some change. If you're not doing well enough to survive, you know we've got mortgage payments, we've got uh, you know braces for our kids, we've got student loans, we've got all we're we're really saddled with debt from the time we're born practically, and and so you know when I left legal services, I did with a lot of remorse, but I knew that you know if I could stick to my mission of using my law and my pr privilege in society to help people, that it would happen, and it did. So again, my mantra has always been doing well and doing good are not mutually exclusive. For sure. That, you know, but they do, they walk very closely yeah, hand in hand. Super important. And I, like, I've seen it time and time again, even with myself, other people, it's, it's great. So Fred, take us kind of quickly through the next chapter, CUNY Law, Fulbright, the, inc the legal incubators, and what you're doing now. Yeah, uh, well, I, I worked in Bethlehem full time in my law practice for about 12 years, and you know, as good fortune would have it, CUNY Law and three other law schools in the U.S. Uh, received funding in order to look for ways to support their graduates, who very much like myself, really wanted to work and help people in underserved communities, but didn't have the background. They didn't have the, we didn't have business skills, and we didn't have the professional skills. You know, in, in, med, in med school, you could never become a, a doctor and start treating patients unless you went through rigorous practical experiences yep. like internship and residencies in, in med school. Law is, is totally different. I mean, you, if, first of all, for the most part, law school is, is theoretical, and so you don't necessarily get a whole lot of practical experience, and you, all you have to do is pass the bar exam. and. I always say if you're lucky enough to pass, because I'm not so sure brains is, is necessarily the only factor in passing the bar exam, if, you, if you're lucky enough to pass, you're a lawyer. And you may have no idea how to represent clients because you never learned it in law school. And so in 1998, CUNY, the University of Maryland, St. Mary's in, in Texas, and Northeastern Law School in Boston all got a grant to try to look for ways to support graduates who wanted to do the right thing in their, in their communities by serving as lawyers in community-based practices but didn't have the skills. And when I realized that that was what was going on, I thought to myself, wow, I went from pretty much from public assistance to 
a law practice where we had four or five lawyers and a whole uh, support staff. And so I knew that I had the battle scars to show that you can do it if you stick to your principles and, and you try to develop good business practices. Um, you can be successful. So what happened was I, I saw what CUNY and the other law schools were doing and I decided to go back to apply to CUNY and see if I could take a job that would enable me on a, in a much larger scale to help new lawyers who wanted to do the same thing that I, I was doing but only 13 years before. And I took the job and I went back to CUNY, this time not as a student but, or, or as a graduate but as an employee and started working at CUNY from 19 98 until uh, 2013. And during that period of time, at CUNY we created a network of uh, lawyers with a very strong commitment to social justice who wanted to work in, in you know, the, the five boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island, wanted to provide their services to people who ordinarily couldn't afford lawyers. And we trained them and how to develop the business skills that they needed to do that and to develop their professional skills. Because again, law school, you graduate, you take the bar, and your professional development doesn't really continue. And so you've got to look for ways to be able to learn how to practice law if you don't have, if you're not working in a large firm or you have somebody there to hold your hand as you go from law school into the practice of law. And that's what we did. You know, law schools, like every school in this country, they'll take your money, they'll give you a degree, and they'll say, see you. Good luck. Yeah. And you're stuck with God knows how much debt. But there are law schools now across this country who understand the value of continuing to educate graduates because lawyers, just like any other professional group, you know, lawyers need to continue to be educated throughout the entire course of their, their practice. So this so this idea, and this became known as a legal, legal incubator? Is, not is that not initially, this... Brian. Initially it was the Community Legal Resource Network. When I started in, in, in 1998, yep. we, we, the idea was to create a network of CUNY grads, again, very much like myself, and we started with 10, then there were 20, then there were 100, then there were 200, and I think there were at one point 300 CUNY grads who were all part of this network. The difficulty was that for them to be educated and trained and supported, they had to go back to CUNY Law. This not as a student, but as, as lawyers. And lawyers, you know, are generally once you graduate, you don't really go back to your alma mater. But they all understood from the, the get go that there was tremendous value in being connected. And we connected people and enabled them to develop their skills. Uh, and it wasn't easy because you know, CUNY back in the days was in a really remote part of Queens, but people made the effort to get there because they wanted to be able to develop their skills so they could better serve their communities. And that went on for, you know, well, it, it continues to go on. The Community Legal Resource Network is still functioning at CUNY. But in, in the back of my mind, after a number of years working with a network that was spread out all over the, the city, uh, I started wondering if there was not a better way to be able to train people. And so that's when the whole concept of the incubator came together. What I found out when I started trying to look at ways to create a program that would train under one roof our graduates so that they didn't have to fight the traffic to come back to CUNY to get educated, there was no model to, to, to look at. There was nothing like that anywhere, um, that, you know, a program that would train law graduates and so under one roof. So I started asking people, what do you think? And someone said, did you ever hear about the incubator model for businesses? And I said, no. But I learned very quickly uh, that there were incubators for all kinds of startup companies in, in New York City. This is in 2007. I mean, there, I, I saw one for graphic designers. Uh, the deal was they would come together for 18 months. They'd learn how to develop their business skills and their skills as graphic designers. I also went to uh, an incubator for bakers and they would have eight hours access to a kitchen and an oven, and they would develop their business skills and they would learn how to bake. And I thought to myself, well, if, you know, so many other kinds of disciplines or professions have incubators, why not an incubator for lawyers? You know, in the back of my mind, this was a program for eight or, eight or 10 lawyers. It could be like a, a pilot program, a model program, and we could see what would happen from there. The New York, New York Times picked up on the story 
Then C CNN headline news picked up on the story. The idea is to provide training and support to law graduates for anywhere from a year, 18 months, two years. And during that period of time, just like medical residents serve in sometimes in urban settings and in rural areas, the lawyers in the incubators develop their skills and also provide uh, either free or very low cost legal support um, in the case of CUNY throughout New York City. It's very exciting to see that. And then, of course, uh, they became internationalized starting in 2012. And was that what your Fulbright work was around as well? Was this international internationalization of the incubator model? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, when I, I was talking before about really never having the courage to apply to law school because I didn't think I'd get in, I didn't think I'd get out, I never thought I'd pass the bar. There was another there was an other area that was also somewhat intimidating, and that was um, the Fulbright program. And for those of you who don't know what the Fulbright program is, it's a program that's funded by the U.S. government, and it allows people from the U.S., either scholars or, or graduates, to go t around the world and provide support, provide share their experiences and, and knowledge around the world. And it also allows people who from different professions to, and, and students from other countries, graduates from other countries, to come to the U.S. to study. Yep. So it's really an exchange program of scholars, and students, and graduates. India came about at Symbiosis Law School. I had oh, been right. there as a, a scholar in residence in 2008. And the, the Dean Shashikala Gupar, Gupar was very interested in, in the notion and the idea of incubators. By the time I, I went to Symbiosis, there was already an incubator up and running. And so she uh, gave the marching orders to uh, some of the faculty members to, to try to get an incubator off the ground. And so that was India. Uh, Pakistan, I started working in Islamabad in 2014. And you know I chose, as a Fulbright specialist, as opposed to a Fulbright scholar in Santo Domingo, I, I applied to the Fulbright Specialist Program. And that allowed me to, to spend a total of 42 days in Pakistan over the course of three trips. And so during those three trips, working with uh, Ali Raza from, uh, he's now with the uh, Peace and Justice Network in Islamabad, we con con contextualized an incubator because you know the model that we started in the US and then in the Dominican Republic was not one that you could just simply Set Plug up and play. And, no. Right. Yeah. It wasn't cookie cutter. I've been working with young Roma lawyers who are trying to develop the skills that they need to be able to serve their communities. And when we talk about really communities with tremendous unmet legal need, the Roma communities in Spain uh, you know, are right up there. There are approximately a million Roma in, in Spain. And I, I know working with my colleagues, we were trying to figure out a number of lawyers Roma lawyers in, in the country, and there may be 25 or 30. 25 to 1 million. It's not Great. A good and ratio. so a lot of young Roma lawyers, or young, young Roma people, are going to law school. They're, they're breaking out of, of, of the you know, years of, of being you know, undereducated. They're struggling to, to, to rise above a lot of the difficulties that they've faced, and they're going into law, they're going into medicine, and it's really exciting to be able to work with them. For sure. So there, there is an incubator in, in Cordoba, Spain, and it's an incubator that was created by Roma lawyers wow. um, for Roma attorneys, but not necessarily exclusively Roma. So if you're watching and you live in a country where you think this could be an interesting thing, get in touch with Fred. We'll make sure that we include his uh, contact information throughout the video as well as in the description of the video. Uh, if you want to bring him in to speak to your university or your law school, or if you want to actually have him come in and consult um, for you guys in terms of how to set these things up, or just have a quick phone call with him, he is a wonderfully accessible human who really cares about this cause. Now, a uh, question. How do you see the movement of incubators evolve since its inception 10 years ago? It's, it's, it's just been beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Again, I, you know, the idea was a program for for eight to ten lawyers, and now that you know the the, the concept has 
has taken hold in the U.S. You know, there are hundreds of, of lawyers now who are part of incubator programs. Again, if you go on Google, ABA, Standing, and Incubator, you can see a list of all the programs in the U.S. and abroad, including the incubators that are, uh, have been set up in other countries. Nobody would have ever imagined you know, back in 2007, 2008, that this would be any, anything other than just a nice program for a handful of yeah. lawyers. All right, so we have a couple questions here as well. Um, how technology innovation is, how is technology innovation changing or adding new dimensions in approaching justice needs? Well, I, this question actually I, yeah, came in from Pakistan. Yeah, the, um, the issue of technology is very interesting because technology is changing the way people access justice in, this, in the U.S. I'll talk about it specifically in the U.S. You know, in 2008, as I mentioned, the, the economy tanked. Yep. And so people, if they, if they had difficulty getting a access to a lawyer before 2008, it became even worse after 2008. And what, ha what happened was there were a lot of programs, a lot of companies that were developing uh, services for people that didn't require the, you know, the services of a lawyer. People began to realize in 2008, you didn't need a lawyer to handle everything. And so what they would do is uh, go online and be able to, you know, to have access to the kinds of things that they used to have to pay lots of money. Yeah. So you could no longer needed to have a lawyer do your will or power of attorney or you know, your divorce. People began to understand that they themselves had the ability to, to do a lot of what was at one point being um, done by lawyers and only lawyers. I mean, in many ways, the difficulty in not only in this society, but societies around the world is that lawyers have had really have had a chokehold on the, the way and the cost of how legal services can be delivered. Yep. And so in the United States, for example, stati statistics show that probably more than 80% of the people in this country have no access to the legal system because they can't afford it. Mm. They can't afford lawyers. And so what, again, people have understood that, uh, that they don't need lawyers, they can do it on their own, and they're doing it on their own in ways that no one would have ever imagined you know, less than 10 years ago. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're doing well. So consumers are using technology in ways that are making things much more affordable, and lawyers are using technology in a way that's you know, re reducing the amount of time and the cost that they need to you know, spend in order to get something done. And it's, it's, it's changing so dramatically that I really would say that in, in 10 years, we would not recognize the practice of law Wow. because it will change that dramatically. Wow, that's, that's interesting. And the, the other thing that I, I think that I would just add to that, just from a person that's not in the legal world, but looks at technology as a way to basically scale yourself and your services. You know, Fred is, is actually a perfect example of how much this landscape has changed in the last 10 years, right? Like right now, Fred doesn't need the New York Times or CNBC to choose him to write a story about him. He can actually start be running all of his own PR. Like look at our careers. The fact that we've been able to speak all over the world we're with people that we've never ever ever met that have found us in some sort of social way, like that is for me, why technology is really exciting for no matter what field you're in. We had one final question, and then I know you have to run to an ABA lunch, but and we really appreciate your time. Is becoming social entrepreneurship attractive for lawyers in third world countries or less developed countries? I think it's beginning to be looked upon more favorably in a lot of the countries that I've visited now than in the past. Um, in a lot of countries, the idea was that if you were going to go into law, it's very much like in the States, you were going to go into law to make a lot of money. And, and so that's really been kind of the mantra of, of people, young people going into law. And it still is. Yeah. But I think that, you know, the thing that makes my life most satisfying is that no matter where I go, 
I always meet young people, middle-aged people, old people, who have a very similar outlook on, on life and an outlook on the world. And that's to be able to do, during the limited time that we have on this planet, to do something to make the world a, a bit better. And so, you know, while the, the, the vast majority of young people in this country would still go to law school because they think that they can make a lot of money, the same in India, Spain, the Dominican Republic, and in Pakistan, the bottom line is in each of those countries, there are pockets of young people who are absolutely determined to change their societies for the better. And the reason they know they, they, they feel that way is because for most of us, it can't get much worse, right? Sure. Um, you know, if, if it gets worse, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad because we know how difficult it is now. In New York City, I'm in New York City today, right? Judge Fern Fisher, who has been the mentor for all of us, was a woman who up until very recently ran the New York City court system. She was dealing with, for example, a housing court. Every day in all of the boroughs of New York City, people come in, tenants come in trying to, to hang on to their, their, their right to live in an apartment. 99% of them come in without a lawyer because they can't afford a lawyer. And so the situation has gotten so bad that now people are beginning to wake up. Young people are saying, you know, if we're going to go into law, we've got to start looking at ways to make law work for you know, people who have been shut out of the system forever. And, and so there aren't lots of those kinds of folks around, but they are, they're around. And if you, you know, if, you, if you put yourself out there, inevitably the universe has this way of bringing people together who have a common goal of making the world a better place to live. And, and, and I, you know, I could tell you about the stories of young people who I've met in all the countries and many other countries around the world who are totally committed to using their skills, their privilege, and their education to change their societies. Uh, and so, just as it was a little bit difficult for my parents to say, well, yeah, my son's a lawyer, but he's working for legal aid, um, we don't value in any society the work of lawyers who are struggling to help relieve the suffering of other people who are shut out of the justice system. You know, we, we really look upon the lawyers who are making, you know, they get out of law school, they're making $180,000 their first year, and then they're, you know, they, then they become partners, and then they're making, you know, God knows how much. I mean, that's what everybody, for the most part, is, is aspiring to, to do. For every reaction, there's a reaction, and my, my sense is that the reaction is that young people are putting aside this idea that they've got to go into law to make a lot of money, and they're going into law because they really are committed to helping people uh, in each of their respective societies. That could be a whole, uh, that could be a whole TV show right there. Um, so Fred, what are some of your favorite resources? If I am a young attorney or an old attorney and, or a middle-aged attorney that wants to do more of this social good, social entrepreneurship type work in the legal world, work and, and maybe I, maybe maybe I actually need to make more than thirty thousand dollars a year or forty thousand dollars a year. What are some resources that you would lead people to to maybe it's grants, maybe it's government funding. What are some stuff that what are some places that you see are helping kind of supplement that income for people? Well if at all. Yeah, yeah I mean there there are ways to be able to supplement your income by doing good things for people. You may not make as much money as you you would if you were in your office billing at an hourly rate. But, you know, if you're interested in helping people, you can do that by going to your house of worship, you know, church, mosque, synagogue, temple, you name it. And in and, 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 and all of those places, you're going to find about pe out about people in the community who are desperately in need of help. Uh, sometimes they can pay. Sometimes they can't. What I found is that, the, that using the law of karma, that everything that you do to help somebody comes back triple fold. And so the, on those instances when I didn't make as much money as I maybe could have made if I said, look, either you pay the money or beat it. And I made the concession to do it either at a reduced rate or, or, or do it for free because I knew that people just couldn't get it otherwise. In all of those instances, the blessings came back to me triple fold because when that person you know, had a neighbor or a family member who needed a lawyer, 
maybe there was an accident, maybe there was something. Uh, they came to me because I was the only lawyer they knew, and I was the only, and they trusted me and they believed in me, and that helped to build my practice, just by being able to again balance the need to to do well with the need to do good, and so, you know, lawyers don't have to necessarily think about their their life as a lawyer in a box, and that box is going from your office to court, court to the office. Lawyers can change lives in, in dramatic ways by just reaching out and, and looking at the tremendous unmet legal need in the United States of America, most of the countries of the world. And um, you know, oftentimes, as a result of, of doing the right thing, it really comes back. And you know, again, the, the universe has a way of taking care of people. If your intentions are right, you know, doors will open in ways that you never imagined. Things will happen that you just didn't expect. And if you, you do it not because you're expecting something in return, but because it needs to be done and it's the right thing to do, it will come back triple fold. That I promise you. That's amazing. Fred, thank you so much for your time, my man. It, you know, um, it's just been such a pleasure to, to watch you and learn from you. And uh, you've certainly been hugely helpful for me in my career, and I really appreciate you. Uh, any final parting words from the people watching? If anyone's been listening to us, thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, and my guess is if you're listening, it, because you probably feel like, you know, you're probably doing something very similar. or And, and so otherwise, you, you would turn this off and watch something on TV. Uh, you know, the more that we work together, whether it's people across the country working together, or those of us who who think that, you know, that the world is much greater than our borders. Uh, there's so much stuff to do. And whether it's through Fulbright or through programs that enable you to get out and see a little bit of the world, understand the, the needs of not only people in our own backyard, but people throughout the world. Uh, I think that the answers to questions of what it is that you need to do, who you're going to do it for, how you're going to do it, will be answered. Fred Rudy, thank you so much. We will put all of Fred's contact information in the description. Uh, always a pleasure to see you, my man. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for everything you do for the world. I love you, man. Guys, you. it's your hour. It's your life. It's your dreams. So go get it. Because if you don't, nobody else will.